All you have to do is beat Gonzaga, and then you'll get a standing ovation. <laughs> That's it. Me? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. We were nobodies, <laughs> which is we're pretty used to at this point, you know? Still nobodies. We are now we are motivated. Let's discuss something and see if Jeremy has an opinion on this. <laughs> This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. We may as well just make BYU basketball head coach Mark Pope the third member of our BYU Sports Nation team because he was with us on Friday, now he's with us on Monday. Let's go every day. Coach, well, let's just do it. Welcome back. Uh, you're a man good for your word, whether it's uh, taking the entire student section out to dinner or uh, helping them practice a court storm effectively. It was, uh, it, was, it was, we had a fun weekend, guys. It was a really great weekend. In October, October 23rd, Midnight Madness, you practice a court storm. How was the execution based on October 23rd versus Saturday night? Well, they, they, it was actually fantastic. Uh, it, it, first of all, I didn't, I didn't hear any reports about anybody getting hurt, which is the most important thing. And uh, we all got to celebrate together on the floor, just like we're all taking this journey together. Um, and so that, that makes it really special. And, and the Rock has been so unbelievable all season for us. They've been so great. And so uh, the fact that they got to celebrate that way, uh, doing it all together, was pretty great. When you roll into the the arena, and they're there before you probably even yep. got there, who knows? Yep. Um, it's all it's like empty except the rock is yep. to the roof. Yep. I mean, what was that feeling like when you walk out and go, "Oh, it's going to be one of those nights." It, it was so it was so cool, and and the, what was even better was the night before Friday night, all the kids that were out uh, sleeping in tents for for forty eight hours. <laughs> uh, David Almodova and his whole team brought them all in, and we had a little pep rally, and um, so. I, I was working in the office, and I, I was supposed to come in at 8.30, so I would just walked down the stairs and walked around, and there it was, like a game day, the rock totally full, uh, everybody decked out in their T-shirts, um, and they were doing some, uh, some karaoke singing competition, which was actually incredible. And, um, and seeing that Friday night before the game was really inspiring. And then uh, that's when I lost my mind and said, hey, we win this game. We're all going to Cubbies after. <laughs> so, so, then, so then after the game, you know, it was mayhem. It was, it was, it was beautiful. It was just beautiful. It was, it, was, it was the greatest senior night I've ever been a part of and maybe that I ever will be a part of because so many things had to come together. And um, – and so after after the game, you know, we have to do media, got to do radio and the press conference. And you conference. do a live hit on ESPN two as well, right? ESPN yeah. two, and, and then and then uh, we had recruits in town. I had to go meet with the recruits, so we're sitting down with the recruits, and, I, and all of a sudden, I'm getting my, uh, Bobby Hordusky, our ops guy, is like, he's like, Coach, we got a little issue at Cubby's. <laughs> <laughs> so he got a couple of decks. Be like, hey, we got to go. So we we raced down there, and and the place was just jam packed, um, and everybody was so excited that they were getting free meals. <laughs> so it cost me a pretty a pretty penny, but it was, it, was, right? it was worth every every dime. <laughs> and the best part was, Cubby James, a really good friend, and so. Uh, so I actually jumped on FaceTime there with I, – I jumped on FaceTime. I'm like, you got to understand what's happening in your joint right now. So Cubby is just there. Uh, he was excited. It was, it was an unbelievable night. And, you know, it is. Like, that's what makes college athletics – so special is because you have these uh, incredibly engaged student bodies and, and this Cougar Nation that, sh- that we get to share this with and we all get to witness what these guys are doing together and it's, it makes it awesome. So the whole night was great. Jeremy and I are headed to Cubby's for lunch after this. So maybe yeah, we were a little late to that. Right. We're a little yeah. late hey, to the free dinner. He's still, I'm sure he's still got my credit card, so <laughs> just put it on the table. You know, the thing is, is like, I think it's the word spread. I think there were people that aren't even BYU fans that just were like, hey, there's free food at Cubby's. <laughs> Let's roll down there at 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I've paid for a lot of people's yeah, dinner. Yeah, freeloaders. <laughs> good night, right? The Gonzaga bus pulls up. Hey, at least he's buying his dinner on the way out. Mark's doing just fine. The other one. Yeah. That was, uh, that was, yeah, that was crazy. And you told us a story during the break of just the international reach of that. Do you mind yeah. sharing that one? Yeah, it's, you know, of course, I mean, all of us. Like, this was fun. It's Everybody, like every BYU fan is connected to other BYU fans. And so um, I got a text. Uh, actually, I just got it this morning. It had been sitting on my phone waiting for me here for for a day. But um, 
a friend who took an overnight flight to uh, to London, and um, so he missed the game. And then he was in church that Sunday. He was like, all anybody was talking about was the game, and, and that's pretty great. It's uh, it's it's something that's extraordinarily unique to BYU, and it, it is it is awesome that we get to share this together. I mean, we do we we share it together. I mean, I, I got so many pictures of people in their living rooms watching the game or celebrating that way, and. Um, it, it, it's awesome, and it was such a great night. And it was fun to see who showed up as well yeah. in the gym. It wasn't. It, it, it was the amazing BYU crowd. Yeah. But let's see. Danny Ainge was there. Dale Murphy was there. Fred Warner, Daniel Sorensen, Kyle Collinsworth was back. Yeah. A bunch of guys. Everyone wanted to be at this game. Yeah, um, because we love this place. You know, it's, it's BYU is an incredibly special place, and and it's. I think it's 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 for all, especially these former players and former greats and. Um, you know, it, it means something to them, and, and uh, it means something to us as a staff and a team. Uh, we want we want all those people that have kind of built this incredible place to be proud of the product, and I think they were Saturday. BYU basketball head coach Mark Pope with us on BYU Sports Nation. We've been asking our fans what was the best thing they saw on Saturday night, and I know it's going to be hard for you to pick one thing. By the way, congratulations on win number 100 in your head coaching Thank career. You. Thank you. What was the best thing, if you could think, like, Pull out a singular moment from that night. Um, well, there, there's a lot. Uh, and just because it's the most recent, uh, Tom Holmo actually sent me a picture of his son and his grandson, four-year-old grandson, uh, on his son's shoulders. And it's is there a storm in the court? And his four-year-old son has a headband and his hair's all f- frayed and he's got his jersey on. And he is just so passionately <laughs> like, you just see this freeze frame. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> right? Four-year-old boy on his dad's shoulders. And um, in a big picture, if there's anything that BYU sports is supposed to be, it's supposed to be that. Because I, I kid you not, like I hear it all the time now, like this young, this young person, just like so many others, 25 years, 30 years from now is going to like have something inside them about an experience they had with their dad at this game that, that they'll, it'll, it'll stir things inside them that are really special. So on one side, it's that on the other side, it's uh, after the game, looking at my guys, uh, our, our team uh, standing there together, kind of each taking a shot to to say something to the crowd, um, uh, the journey that they've walked and that there, there's still a lot left for them to walk and getting to witness them. Um, cause you don't, as a player, you know, even senior night, when those guys walked out, they don't really get a chance to take it in because they have serious work at hand, right? They, they, had, they were on a mission, but after the game for them to be able to just stand there a little bit elevated so they could kind of see all the madness and chaos and, and be able to talk to the fans and be able to share that moment with each other. That'll stick with me forever. Cause that's, that, that was a beautiful moment. It was fun for everyone involved. We'll break down Pepperdine tomorrow on the Pope Show and kind of push it forward a little bit. Uh, but it, with with this situation and and climbing to number seventeen now and net of fourteen, how do how do you keep this going? Because I know you've said we have some goals that are dangerous. Yeah, so um, you know it's uh, you, you 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 know co- as coaches we're just uh, we're, we're always just living in a paranoid world. And so you think if we lose that game, it's really hard to recover from. And winning that game is hard to recover from. And then people ask you, well, what's going to make you happy? And the only thing that makes us happy is winning the next game. Um, and so, you know, we'll dial back in today. And um, and the one thing about this veteran group of players that we get to work with is that they understand that every game is so hard. And generally, 100%, it is 100% true. This game Saturday against Pepperdine is going to be harder than this game against Gonzaga was last Saturday. And so we have to prepare and we got to get better this week. We have to really focus on getting better. And these guys have, you know, they they didn't come back. All these guys didn't come back and they didn't stay to beat Gonzaga on senior night. They came back to try and do bigger things than that. And so we still have that that goal firmly in mind and, and we'll work hard on it. Are you flying the rock to Malibu on uh, Friday night? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, um, I had to check my bank account and make sure I'm still, make sure I'm still in the black here. <laughs> Coach, great to have you. Congratulations again. Thanks, man. Mark. Just an unforgettable night. Thanks, guys. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. 
Down go the Zags while the Cougars rise up. BYU pulls off one of the top five wins in Marriott Center history. And best Gonzaga, senior night, number two team in the country in town. A bunch of different notable streaks on the line. The most important, however, Jerem, BYU's now won eight straight games in the West Coast Conference. For eight. the first time ever. You have to go back 12 years to get eight games in a row. Jeremy, right in there, league. There were so many palpable, unforgettable, amazing moments within that 91-78 win against Gonzaga. You stood next to me for the majority of the second half right behind the BYU yeah, bench. I, I was up when I started, and then I was like, I'm going with you, man. You're behind the BYU. <laughs> I, so you and I sat behind the or stood behind the BYU bench in like a really awkward spot where we'd never be unless it was this game. Incredible. Yeah. What was the best thing your eyes witnessed on Saturday night? The court storm, because it meant BYU won, and it meant the seniors went out on the high note, and it meant that number two Gonzaga went down. I mean, this was an all-time night in the Marriott Center. The game was so good. BYU played such a great game. They put up 91 on number two Gonzaga. And these, the, the Rock was there two hours before. It's like an empty gym. Sean Farnham does this hit for the web. Where he, it's an empty gym and he turns and it's the rock and it, it was just overflow. The, the students who got there last, and so, a lot of students were turned away, were in obstructed view seating for the first time ever. And they're on the court and Mark Pope's high five and everybody, and the seniors have this moment where they get to talk as well. And this was awesome. The second recorded court storm in BYU basketball history. BYU did the unthinkable. We, we thought they could hang in this game. To win by 13, which is the exact same margin, by the way, as the San Diego State 2011 game of note, was unbelievable. And what did I say Friday, and what did we discuss, would be a major difference in this game? Yoli freaking Childs yep. makes it a 36-point swing from losing by 23 in Spokane to winning by 13 at home. This was a coronation for a senior group has not made the NCAA tournament, who didn't even make the NIT last year, and exactly 350 days later, after losing to San Diego in disappointing and embarrassing fashion, Childs comes back, Toulson comes back. As Mark Pope joked, TJ Haas stayed. Forever. Meanwhile, you got Alex Barcelo. And these guys and these fans will remember this night forever. That was an amazing experience. The BYU fan base as a whole needed this so much. The court storm was epic and poetic, really, because they practiced it in October. How about that? Mark Pope <laughs> has the rock practice a court storming in October, and we got a kick out of it. Like, oh, that's awesome. The last game BYU will play in the Marriott Center in the 2019-2020 season they get to actually storm the court and celebrate a win over second-ranked Gonzaga. That is unreal. Unreal. And then he spends 1800 bucks and buys the whole Rock student section dinner at Cubby's. I mean, the happiness on the coaches and their families' faces and the smiles on the seniors' faces when they came off the court with about 30 seconds left to play. Jake Toulson, TJ Haas, Yoli Chaz, just to see... An eruption of happiness. It was unreal. Like It was almost slow motion. I loved every second of it. I didn't get to experience the 2011 Jimmer Fredette versus San Diego State scenario. But I was going to make sure that I was in the midst of this Sure you did, just not one. in person, right? Not, not in person. Right, and, and Cougar Nation celebrated. Whether you're watching it on TV, and by the way, it's on demand on the BYU TV app. You can watch that a gajillion times if you want. I tweeted out. Several people were like, yeah, I already have. I went home and watched the game again, right? Like, I, I know you did as well. This was awesome. And, oh, by the way, what, what did I say to you with a couple minutes left? I said, it'd be awesome if Dalton Nixon could get in. He's not in a boot. Like, he could sub in if the scenario is right. And Mark Pope calls a timeout just to sub in Dalton Nixon. He takes the uh, turnover, but he gets in the game and then, and then walks out. Just to, it just, everything was perfect. Feel good. Everything was perfect. The senior ceremony before, and, and we chatted with T.J. Haas and Yoli Childs after, and and uh, TJ and Yoli were like, man, it was, it was hard before. It was very emotional. And it was this, this thank you for coming back. Thank you for this season. And they gave the fans uh, a thank you of their own. We did the show in the Marriott Center for the first time on Friday because we got the sense that this was something really, really big. And we all felt it. And Monday I tweeted out, 
This is going to be the closest thing to San Diego State 2011. Like, I felt the buzz early, right? And it absolutely was. People have asked me, what's better? What's better? I don't really care right now which one is better. They were both unbelievable. And BYU wins this amazing game. It's just the, the, the last time BYU beat a number two team at home was 1965. It was in the Smithfield House against St. Joseph's. This was amazing. It was beating Gonzaga. It was beating number two. It was, senior. It was all these amazing things. And what was the best thing I saw? All of it. Like, like all of it was it's awesome. It's hard to pick one thing. And I loved that the senior showed up, too, like you talked about, Spencer. Yoli Childs, 28 and 10. How good, how good was he? TJ Haas, 16, defensively at the beginning of the game, drawing charges. Jake Toulson makes five threes. Zach Suggis has 12 points. Oh, Zach was so awesome defensively, ripping the ball away from Gonzaga, players on the ground. He did he, everything he that we, Tilly. we... He took yes. the place of Dalton Nixon yes. defensively. He did the things that Dalton Nixon does. Yes, and Gavin Baxter scores his first bucket. It's like this tip dunk, you know, and it was like, Baxter, wheel of cheese! You know, it's just... Everything played out really nicely. Alex Barcelo only has three points in this game, but that three pointer is big. Uh, and he when did it, it, comes. it. He did it against Utah State as well. Could not hit a shot against the Aggies. Right, one of eight. Late uh, yeah. hits the dagger three. Hits an absolute dagger of a three late against Gonzaga. Just everything played out so well. And a lot of this, it, people have asked, okay, what's better, beating number one Gonzaga in Spokane or this? I'm saying this, and here's why. What have we waited for for four years? almost five, an NCAA tournament team. To, for BYU to be that, that program that they were for a long time. When Dave Rose started, BYU goes to the NIT from nothing, and then they go to like eight NCAA tournaments in the next nine years. And we're like, oh, the NCAA tournament's like a thing we do, right? And then it became a thing that didn't happen with BYU for four years. The metric shifted. It became harder now for non-power teams to get into the big dance. Well, and it's more than that. BYU just wasn't and good enough. they weren't enough. good enough. Just they weren't, weren't good, good enough. enough. That's yeah. where it, it starts here, and then you look at other factors, right? And this team has been more than good enough. As soon as Jake Toulson and Yoli Childs were back, right, you and I said this is an NCAA tournament team. What we didn't anticipate is nine-game suspension, Compound dislocation, Gavin Baxter's injury, Dalton. They fought through so many things to get to this point. And now it's just, they played this amazing schedule that Dave Rose left them. They went to Maui. They go to Houston. They win. They play San Diego State tough. And then to see this moment, and I hope this isn't the best moment of the year. It could be. Yoli Child said that as well. I don't want this to be the greatest moment of this season. The, The only way it's not is if BYU makes the Sweet 16. If BYU makes the Sweet 16, that's, that's the moment. And then we put this team in the top three all-time category. We would. Right now, they're on the outside looking in. But this team, and T-E-A-M is the key there, has been so good. This is so good. The culture's been amazing. It's been so fun. Hands down, the best team that BYU has played with in the West Coast Conference. Yes. It's not close. Yes. It no. is not close. And th- they bought in, right? You've had seniors play roles where they could have been upset. They're a freshman going, you know what? Like, Trevin Nell could be, like, super bugged. Like, oh, I broke my thumb, and I get no playing time. They don't care. What an opportunity to learn. And I told him after the game, I said, dude, the NCAA tournament's hard to get to. Just enjoy every second of this. And hopefully you're scoring 20, and we're in the tourney in a couple of years. But, like, enjoy this journey. And this journey's been awesome. This they, journey's been so fun. They are so – no hidden agendas. Mm-hmm. I've said it so many times over the past few months. There are no hidden agendas on this team. It doesn't matter who scores, how they score, as long as BYU wins the game. And that's the that's agenda. That's all they care about. Everyone has an agenda, but the agenda is to win. The collective yeah. agenda is to win. You talked about the senior stepping up. Yoli Child specifically did something – very, very unique and spectacular, which takes us to our stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. Yoli Childs and his 28 points, 10 rebounds, 3 assists, and 63.2% shooting from the field. That stat combined is the first player to post those type of numbers against a number one or number two ranked team since Dwayne Wade. Had a triple-double in 2003 against Kentucky in the Elite Eight. Not bad. <laughs> and, and, again, I'll say it, a 36-point swing. BYU plays without him in Spokane and loses by 23. They play with him at home, and BYU wins by 30. A 36-point swing. What is his value to this team? It's that, man. 36 points. Swing. His value to the team is, if he doesn't cramp up at Utah, BYU has another solid victory on the resume. 
Yeah, and Utah's then 24 a, and 6. Utah's a quad two loss. Boy, State's a quad two loss. San Francisco's a quad two loss, right? Uh, you only played in two of those three. We'll break down the resume coming up, but things are going well, man. BYU's 17th. They just beat Gonzaga. Like, life is good. Let's enjoy this. As, as Jake Tulson said, let's party! And then Bodie <laughs> Fullick tweets out, like, hey, just got to Jake's house. And it's like some cheesy, uh, you know, table with, like, cookies and punch in it. No people there. <laughs> Nobody it's there. Nice and quiet, <laughs> reverent. Bony strikes again. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. And we welcome in a guy who is uh, making a name for himself as well at BYU, Yoli Childs, current West Coast Conference Player of the Week, one of the BYU all-time greats. Yoli, nice to have you in studio. Uh, Yoli? Appreciate you guys having me on, as always. By the way, you've officially climbed into the first team on my all-decade team. It's, yeah? It's official. Wow. Yeah. It's I a, had you there originally. Wow. You yeah, know that, right? It's yeah. beautiful. You, you, you uh, accosted me after a uh, practice to discuss. <laughs> I just wanted. Day. I just wanted to hear your logic. That's all. Yeah, and uh, now it now it feels foolish. So I've changed my mind. You're on the first team. No, oh, that's love. Did I wait till sure. you were pressuring me in studio? Perhaps. <laughs> but here we are. You didn't pressure me. I just did it. So yeah. <laughs> it just sat down. He was like, "Okay, you're on the first." You team. You know what? You're <laughs> taller than I remember. Uh, have you come down from the high of, of Saturday, or are you still kind of riding that? Yeah, for sure. Um, what? I, I'm sorry. That's just how we are. Everyone on our team is. and uh, We had a great practice yesterday, and uh, we're just really focused on Pepperdine. They're a really good team, and we're really excited for the opportunity to get better and uh, show that we're continuing to improve. But Sorry, we're not going to move on to Pepperdine in this conversation until the end. Is that, o- right. is that okay? That's fine. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> we have some fun things to discuss. Yes, there are. Okay, uh, let's talk about this. Uh, you and your wife, Megan, were part of a fireside Sunday night, and uh, from what we hear, it was packed, just like the Marriott Center. Um, what was that experience like for you coming off the high of a win and then going into a situation like that? It was awesome. Um, I was really looking forward to it, and uh, it was definitely a lot easier after a win than after a loss. So <laughs> um, it was fun, and uh, it's always really inspiring, especially to speak to the youth and uh, I love hearing my wife speak as well. She's she's really talented, so um, it's a lot of fun, and uh, it was a great environment. Different than the Marriott Center, but a great environment. No one stormed the chapel? They didn't storm the <laughs> chapel, no. Gotcha. Uh, if you had free cookies or something, maybe they'd do that after. But uh, let's let's talk about it. It's been a couple of days since Saturday. How would you describe the events that happened Saturday? Because that was a night you'll remember for the rest of your life. Yeah, it was amazing. Like, I've just – every time I think about it, it seems like a movie. You know, it's just – such a storybook feel and um, it's crazy because life never goes how you expect it to or how you want it to and uh, so when it does it it feels pretty good and uh, just so many things leading up to it you know just all the emotions of senior night you know last game is with this team on the home court Um, just to be able to win the way we did with fight with toughness and, and playing together was it was an incredible experience I'll remember it forever for sure. I think I can make like a top 25 list of all the amazing poetic storylines that existed just within that game, including your final bucket at the Marriott Center, which is a hammer down dunk. And then just a, just so much emotion coming out after that. Uh, what does it mean to you to have those two points be your final points in the Marriott Center? I'm just so happy I can dunk again with this stupid <laughs> finger. <laughs> like, I, w- when I couldn't dunk, I was just sitting there like, I don't know how you guards do this. Basketball is just its not as fun when you can't, when you can't try to pull the rim off. So um, it, it was definitely fun to be feeling a lot more healthy. And, um, yeah, it was, it was fun. It's definitely uh, one of the 20-plus poetic things in the game. It was, it was cool. So you crossed a threshold with your finger at some point where, okay, I'm okay kind of making contact with the rim then? Yeah, yeah. I kind of try to hang on it with the base of my hand a little more, but yeah, yeah. Us yeah. too. We get that. Yeah, high. you guys know. Up you guys we know the deal. Yeah. We're above the rim, kind of guys. <laughs> that that this game was <laughs> this. What are you laughing at? <laughs> this game was so fun in so many ways. We've ta- talked about it, but just when you go into a game, sometimes you guys have to create the energy. It just came to you in this one. Like the crowd was. Uh, amazing for this. So when you walk out and realize, okay, this is special, and we had talked about it all week and kind of felt that, how did you use that to your advantage? Uh, We really do have the best fans in the world. And a lot of people can say that about their schools and say that about their teams, but 
uh, when you look at that atmosphere, you know it's real. And uh, we really do have the best fans. They travel, and I'm sure we're going to have a ton more on uh, Saturday. Uh, but it, it was surreal. And um, it's one of those situations where you have to almost control your emotions because you don't want to – you don't want to have too much adrenaline. You don't want to go too crazy to start a game. But um, they gave us a ton of energy throughout the whole game. And uh, I think it really makes a big impact on not only our team, but the teams that we play against. Yoli Childs with more dunks and fewer boring layups in Studio B. I love layups. On BYU Sports Station. <laughs> they count all the I same. I like dunks better. Yes, okay, I, yeah. I like I like the uh, the savvy that he has around the hoop as well. A couple dunkers over here. Okay, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Yoli, you had to sit out and watch your guys play against Kansas and play against Gonzaga the first time and play against St. Mary's the first time. And San Diego State. And San Diego State. You finally got to crack at one of these like elite-level teams. Uh, so what was that like for you emotionally going from, man, sitting out those first four to finally getting your shot? I, it just felt so good to be out there with my team. And uh, I think the situations that I've been through this season have helped me not take things for granted. And – um, I really enjoy every single moment being out there with my team. And uh, it was definitely hard being an extra coach on the sidelines. I don't know how coaches do it. So uh, I'm sure that's really frustrating for them sometimes. But it just felt so great to be out there and uh, be able to contribute on the court. Let's talk about uh, the player of the year race. We we gave our opinions. I think you were in here for that. Uh, do you feel like you're, you should win WCC player of the year? Do, do you care? Would that be validating for the group? I do not care at all. I really okay, we'll don't. care for you. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I really don't. I mean, um, I would much rather go and win the conference tournament and, and go do big things with this team because um, I wouldn't even – I don't know if I'd even consider myself the player of the team. You know what I mean? We we have so many guys that bring it every single night. And some nights it's me, some nights it's Jake, some nights it's TJ, some nights it's Dahl, all the way down the list. But um, we do it together. Every single night it's, it's playing for each other and – having each other's back. So uh, I, I don't know about the whole the player of the year or like all the team awards, stuff like that. I, I just really want to win and win big with this team. When in this process of coming back did you feel like this team bought into that culture? Because everyone can say it, but we see it. Yeah, I think um, obviously you have individual agendas. It, it would be really weird if people didn't. Um, but it started, I think, with an understanding that when you win big and you win together, your individual agendas take care of themselves. When you're on a winning team, everything gets better in your, in your personal life, in your personal career. Um, so I think it started there, but it really quickly evolved into just a genuine love for each other. I think uh, after our trip to Italy, I think we really uh, were all kind of bought in on just, I'm going to sacrifice and give everything I can to this team. And uh, it's really a special group to be a part of. I just remembered, you know, Zach breaks his foot in Italy, and that was the first of several injuries, right, that you yeah. guys have overcome, which has been incredible that you guys have just continued through this. And it was cool to see Dalton get on the court. You gave him a massive hug yeah, that right was, when he checked out. I didn't see that coming. That was that was really amazing to, to have him back out there one last time. And uh, I'm sure that meant a lot to him and his family. And um, I wish – I wish the fan base, I wish Cougar Nation could see what this guy does every day in practice, his leadership on and off the court, his fight, his intensity every single day. And um, he's a huge leader on this team. He inspires me. He inspires all of us. Yo. Uh, shameless plug, uh, tonight on BYU Basketball with Mark Pope, Kevin, Nixon, and Dalton sit down and chat, and then they simulate the 92 shot. Uh, one of them makes it. On the first show. Oh, snap. So uh, was it Kevin or was it Dalton? There's Let's also a feature with Yoli Childs on tonight's Deep BYU Blowers Basketball tonight. Post. And you oh, haven't awesome. seen it? I have not. I've seen it. Oh, it's yeah? awesome, man. Is it good? You're going to like it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. It'll, it'll air tonight. Bring a lot of tissues, Yoli. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yoli Childs with us on BYU Sports Nation. Winning on Saturday at Firestone Fieldhouse in beautiful Malibu. Locks down a two-seed and a triple buy in the West Coast Conference Tournament for BYU Basketball. What does Pepperdine do that has your attention the most? Uh, it's it's going to be a huge game, and uh, that, that buy is going to be uh, really big, and we're shooting for that. But uh, the way they move the ball, their, uh, their ability to have five guys on the court almost at all times that can pass, dribble, and shoot is huge. Uh, they're very similar to us in that aspect where uh, they're hard to guard because there's not necessarily guys that you can help off of. And uh, they have a lot of guys that can really get it going. Colby Ross is an unbelievable player. Both the Edwards brothers are incredible. So 
uh, we really got to be locked in one through five and be ready to help each other on the defensive end. Did you get cookies Saturday? Did I get cookies Saturday? You talked about it, remember? <sighs> I actually Someone didn't. Someone said, how are you going to celebrate? No. I didn't. But some cookie company. Crumble. Was, <laughs> no, don't say the name. Oh, my bad. They were hitting me up on Twitter. You guys, where's the camera? Which right, one's right that? Here, right. You guys can't do that. <laughs> I've already missed so many games. He's already missed I don't nine need plus it. four. I, I will not accept any free anything. <laughs> Ever. A cookie company, Spencer. A co- I, I'm sorry. I I'm, so sc- I'm so scared of those guys. I, I, I understand. <laughs> Listen, you, I understand. You're what? I'm, uh, five weeks away from being able to go get all the I'm not, whatever. No comment. <laughs> After you win the national title. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, BYU Sports Nation, karma boost to you. Yes. And Pepperdine. Thank you. Go win that. Take, and then, take uh, that energy, that karma to Firestone Fieldhouse. Rock that place, man. Yeah. Go. Appreciate we'll, uh, it. Be in Vegas. Awesome. But you won't until like 13 days from now after. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a minute. Okay, awesome. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it, guys. I'll have random cookies for anybody available in June. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Let's make it even better and bring in a former NCAA Tournament Selection Committee member on several occasions and current BYU Athletic Director Tom Homo. Tom, great to have you in Studio B. It's almost March Madness. I know, man. How much uh, happier are you and less stressed now versus when you were on the committee? I'm sure that was a fun, cool experience, but there was a lot of info to take in. Well... Especially the first year I was on the committee was when we got – that was the last time we got in. And being on the committee and watching your team and then having to leave the room and come back in and go, what, what, what just happened? What, what happened? We were, were first four out or first four in? It was very stressful. Uh, I wished I had more stress the last three years. But it's a time this year where, you know, all things considered with the year we've had, we're in. It's just a matter it's now of, of how what we can do to finish off these next couple of games that we have a uh, super important game Saturday, then the tournament, and then here we go. Let's talk about that game on Saturday. What kind of impact could BYU's result against Pepperdine have on seeding for the Cougars with just a few games remaining? Really the way I look at it is this game against Pepperdine Saturday – is almost like the first game in the NCAA tournament. Mm. Because whatever happens in this game, win or lose, it's going to affect where we're seated in the tournament. Now, we're talking way down the road. I shouldn't do that. I'm a former coach. But you really have to take this game and put all your attention into it, and which they will, because that has a lot to do with where we get seated down the road. I like that point, that this is essentially like a quarterfinal. If you approach it that way, it feels even bigger, right? So BYU at Pepperdine Saturday. Then BYU goes to Vegas. Should the Cougars win Saturday, they'll be the two seed, and that's a big deal because you get the uh, Gonzaga bracket, the one and two, get a triple bye. That's a big deal, too. It certainly is, and there's a reason that the WCC Executive Council went to this schedule for the WCC tournament. Because we were in a situation a number of years ago where you had a really high-seeded team like Gonzaga or particularly BYU or St. Mary's, and you'd get into the tournament and you'd be playing the winner of the 10-9 game. And you'd win that game and drop in your then RPI, now net. Now that can't happen. Whatever happens, the top two seeds, whoever they may be, are going to get buys, and they'll be playing a really good net team, and it's not going to affect them in an adverse way if they were to happen to lose that game. And what's great for BYU, and we've talked about it, is uh, there are two quad ones sitting there, possibly, right? Yeah. St. Mary's, and if you get through that one, you think Gonzaga is likely to get in the next two quad ones, maybe. Yeah, quad ones are a beautiful thing come mm-hmm. Selection Sunday. And I think everybody's starting to understand how that works. I really enjoy the fact that people have caught on to what the quad system means, and uh, when it first came out, what says quad business? I think every analyst knows exactly what it is. And most of the kind of you know, yeoman people out there can go, hey, yeah, quad, we, we need to play a better schedule. And I love that. And, and this year was exactly that. And that was a gift from uh, you guys and, and Dave Rose and everybody to have Maui, to have Houston, to have San Diego State. This was 
perfectly set up for this group of seven seniors, right? Right, and it's kind of fun. Like with, we'll go back to football scheduling now. People are always are going, we hey, going there, Tom? How about the schedule? What do we do? <laughs> how, and, and this is a situation. Football and basketball are way different, right. but it, the, the stars were perfectly aligned this year. The schedule was such that if you brought the players together and the coaching staff and all the chemistry on the team came together with the schedule, bam, you got it. And that's what happened. That's why we are where we are in our net. 30 in D1 and 9 in non cut Wild. The schedule. Just yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it certainly helps when you win a few of those yeah, big on games. On the other side of it, if, if we didn't really have a, a, a loaded team this year and it was a weaker rebuilding, it would not look good and we'd be taking criticism. It just happens such that stars were aligned. BYU Athletic Director Tom Homo with us on BYU Sports Nation. Right now, the Cougars are projected as a six seed in most major bracketologist rundowns. ESPN, Joe Lenardi, of course, leading the way there. Two spots out of a potential five seed. So uh, on the seeding line, I wish I could give you a blind resume and say, oh, it's not attached to BYU per se, because I know you. it's different now for you, but is it too high, too low, or, or just right? Do you think they've earned the six seed? You know, I just... I love our team, and so I'm going to be biased, and I'm going to be very optimistic about where we could be. But that's not really my duty as the AD. Everybody in BYU Cougar Nation is going to feel like we deserve more and better. But what the way, being on that committee and knowing that, I'm just going to go, let it go. Let it flow. What's going to happen is the way we play Saturday and the way we play in Vegas is going to give us the right seed. We have nothing to do to affect that other than to play well and win. <laughs> and so these are not home games. They're neutral games, well, except for Saturday, a road game. So there's a lot of work that we can do Saturday and in Vegas that's going to enhance our opportunity to be a four, a five, a six. On the other side, a seven or an eight. Don't so say eight, there's Tom. A lot, no eight or nine. There's a lot of work that has to be done by the Cougs. Let's talk about the uh, Sunday play issue and how that affects BYU on the seed line. Can you explain as a committee member, okay, if BYU's in and Sunday play's not a thing, they're limited to the Thursday, Saturdays, and how that may affect seeding for a team like BYU? Sure. It's, it's actually pretty simple that I've seen it, and I've actually watched it happen. But you have this software package, and they start putting the uh, teams in and seeding them, the one, the two, the three, the four on the first line. Then you go to number second line, two, five, six, seven, eight. When you get to BYU, the um, package, the software package says, uh, have to play on Thursday. And so now, all of a sudden, if BYU was slotted to go in at, say, I'm just going to throw out a number, 20. There you go. You'll like that one. <laughs> and that number 20 tournament game was on a, was a Friday, Sunday. They would move BYU to the next line. Okay. Meaning not 21? 21. Okay. Not down another whole line, right. but 21. But if and they then, were 23 and the next cut for a 6 was a 24, then they'd go down a seed line five to six. Possibly. possibly. You could possibly okay. go down a whole seed line. Gotcha. It, and and I, I would have to tend to agree that where we are, there, it's possible that they could move them up. Uh, ooh, so up is a possibility. Not, it's very, very thin. Okay. The probability would be they move them down. And I'm okay with that because that's the way it works. The same thing would hold true if for some reason, like you say, some people are saying there's 10 teams in the Big Ten. If you get down to a, a line and you have two teams right next to each other and you can see that they're going to end up having to play each other, in a, they're not next to each other, but the way they would be seated, and the software picks it up right away. Wow. And they show that Michigan State's going to be playing Iowa. At, Iowa moves down a line, and someone gets a benefit of that. So this happens uh, probably a lot, right? It, it happens takes a all the while time. to sort all that out. And, and what is it in terms of... Same league, uh, X amount of rounds. Is it the first two rounds? Yeah, right? I, I, oh, it's the first two. I think you can get into Trying the Sweet 16. The yeah, you, you want to avoid the same league matchups. They even try to do it. They try to do it with not having matchups of a non-conference game. So that if was we already were, played. Yeah, so if we were going to play Houston, if they are going to have a rematch again, it would be up to, I mean, so all of a sudden we're playing Houston in the first round? then we'd already played them. They would do everything they could, and then the committee would make a decision to say whether or not that was in the best interest or if it would be an unfair thing to move Houston or BYU somewhere down the seed line. Ah. That would be unfair. Or they might just go, you know what? 
It's better for them to play each other again than to disadvantage one by moving them down the seed line. And rematches the next year are considered as well, except yeah. <laughs> when we play Texas A&M two years ago. They do row. consider it, yeah. but it does happen. And in, in that particular situation, the committee said, look, the best thing for these two teams is that they play each other, and it, it would be a disadvantage to one to have to move them down. Mm. You spent four years on this committee, right? Yeah. Four years. I mean, you've been in the room, so we're fascinated by all of this. Uh, when a team like BYU is, is placed, and they obviously have to be in a Thursday-Saturday quadrant, um, h- how much can the committee be like, well, we, we, we want to do it regionally. We want BYU to be somewhat close to home. Does, does that factor in at all for a team like BYU? No. <laughs> Not really, and it, it really shouldn't. Every team in the country, when your line comes up and you're the number 29 team, you get slotted for that location. And that location is, for us, if it's on a Saturday, sun, or a, a Friday, Sunday, it's going to move. Okay. That's just how it's going to be. No problem about so it. So it could be BYU's playing in Albany. That's just could how it be. works out. That, and, and because, and if that were the case, it would, might be because we had to go to a Thursday game. And we, sure. know, and we know the four Thursday sides, so we already know where BYU is going to end up, right? Right. Which it's Spokane, St. Louis, Tampa, and Albany. Okay. Those four, right? And so, like, when it comes down to that, there's going to be the conspiracy theory. A lot of people at BYU are going to go, it didn't happen. That's not what. They, they messed it up, and they were biased. No, that's not how it's going to work. It's all software. It shows all the contingencies that they voted on years ago. And sometimes they update them, but it's all in the policies and procedures. So it takes it out of the hands of the 10 voters except if it gets to a point where it's going to disadvantage the team. Okay, so the next time somebody asks me, hey, where do you think BYU is going to end up? I'll say, mm, probably Spokane or St. Louis or Tampa or Albany. Yeah. One you, of those you, four. Those right. are the Thursday Saturdays. <laughs> it makes sense. Probably one of those four. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And, uh, yeah, so we've got the resume right here. BYU 3-4 and four in quad one, 4-3 and three in quad two, 15-0 and oh in quad three and four. How do you feel about this resume with a week to go in the regular season? I feel great about it. I think one of the things that's happened in the last couple of years is we've had teams during the regular season where you're thinking, you know what, we got a shot, we got a shot, and then we would lose to a, a quad three team or maybe a quad four team. Killer. When you get in that room on Selection Sunday and you look at quad three and quad four losses, Ooh. there's nothing that's going to drop you faster in the in – the, uh, seating or out of the tournament than that. So that's what makes the regular season so special is that you're going to play not everybody in quad one and two. You're going to play some three and four games. You got to win those games. You can afford if you have one win, quad one wins and twos, if you have some good ones in there, you can afford a little bit of a, a, a mishap in quad three. But quad four, that's tough. And you're going to have those games. And every once in a while we've We've kind of misstepped and lost some of those games. And let's acknowledge, uh, you know, the, the quad three against San Diego. BYU's down with 12 seconds to go. The alley-oop happens. Survive. What's right? the difference? Or even like the Houston game. TJ makes that shot. That Houston game is the game that's been hanging in quad one as our lone win for a long time. Yeah. And now all of a sudden we have Gonzaga and And Utah State has climbed from a 50-something up to 35. Right. And UCLA has gone from 102 up to 78. And so look at UCLA as the way they're playing right now and the way the Pac-12 is going. They could move fast as a P5 team playing in their tournament. If they were to win the Pac-12 – who knows how far they is, how high they ascend. They could help BYU potentially get another they could. spot or two, right? Yeah. If they climbed into quad one somehow. The next and we've got a segment called the Rootables where uh, we look at BYU's former opponents and say, okay, root for this team. Because <laughs> tonight, root for this team. Root for this team. Root for yeah, this exactly. team. Uh, Absolutely. And we'll do that in just a little bit. Um, I, the, the schedule for BYU this year, having played San Diego State, Kansas Gonzaga twice, maybe three times. That's pretty wild. When you look at those are number one seeds, three of the four number one projected seeds right now. How much of a reward does that give to BYU when the committee is looking at that type of schedule? SOS, baby. Strength of schedule. Now, the strength of schedule is that uh, analytic is still in, it's included in the net. So sometimes people will look at strength of schedule and say, oh, their strength of schedule, they had, like we have a 14 net and our strength of schedule is a. Uh, 30. 30. And Cougar Nation might think, well, we're going to really get a really great seed because of that. 
because then they're going to put all their, you know, all their uh, marbles on strength of schedule. Strength of schedule is included in that. That's why we're at 14. So don't get too carried away with strength of schedule. It's already adjusted in the net. But in, when you get in that room and then you just, it's maybe between two teams, between who's going to be on a five line and who's going to be on a six line. And somebody in that room or people in that room are going to go, you know what? BYU challenged themselves in their schedule. And it just will happen that this might be a 30 and this team just might be a 190. Ah. They might be a really good team, but their non-conference schedule was not very good. And that difference right there puts deep BYU on the five instead of the six. Wow. Give us an idea of what it's like in the room when there's a back and forth and a debate happens and agendas are had and certain numbers or metrics are favored. What's that like? It's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what I wish. And what the media wishes they could be in the room. I yes. mean, it's a debate that happens every year. Why don't you let us cover it? But I don't think people would be as open and as honest in their expressions. It reminds me of a staff meeting on a football team and on a staff where you have to argue it. You have to fight it out because when you go into that game on Saturday, you better have prepared yourself to make the right calls, to put the best people in position to play, have these golden plays ready to go on fourth and one. You have to have all these situations. And that's what happens in that room. You're super prepared because you fight it out. And that's the thing I miss the most. You might be staring someone down across the table because you know you're going at it, arguing on a situation. And then when we take a break, you go give them a hug and go, all right, we got the right team in. That's us before every show, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> this should be trending. There's a lot of truth in that. Yeah, a lot of exactly. truth in that. Tom, it's so great to have you in the studio. It was a fantastic conversation. Terrific. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks, Tom. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. It is that time, our February football focus. We can't forget about BYU football. Always top of mind. Looking back and looking ahead, a BYU football position breakdown presented by Tim Daly Nissan today. Our focus on the BYU linebackers. And I think we all feel pretty good about what BYU brings back at that position. This is the only position where the two deep is loaded and awesome, and BYU doesn't need anyone else to jump into the two deep per se. They can develop behind him, okay? Zane Anderson. Moves to safety. Let's go, Zane. He's going to play safety. He's not going to play backer. Returners of note, the leading tackler, Kavik Fonua with 83. Had two picks, by the way. Isaiah Kafusi, really good. Keenan Peely kind of got banged up, but he was playing as a freshman early. Peyton Wilgar led the team in picks with three. And Chaz Ayu, <laughs> still undetermined as to what's going to happen there, right, with uh, the news uh, of a, a suspicion of a DUI. It not helps sure. to have a guy like Max Tooley, right, though. Right, Hopefully, If Chad, Chaz plays, great. That's awesome. Um, others of note, Jackson Kafusi, Max Tooley. Is Tyler Algier uh, running back now? We yes. think that's the case. Um, there's one newcomer of note to me. Josh Wilson, will he play as a freshman right away, or is he a redshirt guy? Is he a third stringer? BYU's loaded at this position. I am, I am very excited. Does BYU have an All-American at this position? Probably not, but I think they have a lot of really good players that can impact a the game. There's not a, um, there's not a Kyle Van Noy, Fred Warner type in this group to me. Perhaps Chaz Ayu over his career, sure. But I mean, right now this season, this is a good, this is a good solid. Group, I, well, I really like it. And them. like you said, hopefully Chaz can play, but it helps to have the depth that BYU does yes. if he can. And we saw it this year, and BYU played all these young guys, and uh, you know you, you don't want to have to play young guys per se because that means something's wrong with the juniors and seniors or just the freshmen's awesome, whatever. There are different situations. But ideally, you're playing uh, a, a varied group, right? And BYU played a lot of freshmen, and that hopefully will pay off this year. And these dudes are making crazy athletic plays. We just watched some of the highlights of interceptions. Isaiah Kafusi laying so out. many interceptions. Peyton Wilgar laying out. Yes. They, though, well, the, the linebackers won a couple ga- helped win a couple games. Boise State with some picks, right? USC. It, USC, certainly. Awesome. So bring it again. The best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. BYU basketball rising from the ashes. 
Seriously, 11 months ago, I sent out a poll question on Twitter asking, how many wins do you think BYU basketball will have next year? The majority of people that responded, almost 1,000, said 18 or fewer. Granted, that was right after or Dave fewer. Rose left. Mark, fewer. Mark Pulp had not been announced. Yoli Childs was probably going pro. There was no, no, no Jake Toulson. Was going there was no Alex Barcelo. Yeah. So I understand the trepidation. But here we are. BYU now projected as a six seed in the NCAA tournament at 23 and 7 with Yoli, with TJ, with Jake, with Alex Barcelo, and with Mark Pope. They just beat second rate Gonzaga. Jerem, after adjusting expectations, is it now what or bust for BYU basketball this season? It's win a game in the NCAA tournament. This team is too good not to go and win one. Um, certainly, we will celebrate this team regardless of what happens the rest of the way. Uh, but hopefully, we have more moments. I'm hoping that Gonzaga, beating number two Gonzaga, is uh, we're debating whether that was the best moment or not of the season. Because right now, it's clearly the best moment. But I hope that we're celebrating BYU getting to a Sweet 16 and saying, you know what? This is the third best team in BYU history. You know, And, and having that conversation of, where do they rank all time? That would be awesome. BYU has to go to the tourney, and they have to win. We have to adjust expectations, in my opinion. Things change. Um, if you, you Listen, if you make X and then you get a, a house in a certain kind of car, right? You, what, if you doubled, what if you doubled your income? You could still keep the house and the car and spend it in other ways, right? But typically, you know, you make some upgrades. And the upgrade in this situation is expectations for BYU and what they could do. Uh, they're going to be second in the West Coast Conference, which is awesome. They're going to have another chance at a quad one win with St. Mary's. They're going to have another chance at a quad one game if they do that, uh, if it's St. Mary's and they win and they play Gonzaga again. Then you go to the tourney, and it's like, win a game. BYU's got to win a game. Got to win a game. You can't be top five offensive efficiency, have this senior group, and this amazing situation that BYU has had with who they played and what they've done and and not win in the NCAA tournament. So I say, yeah, got to win the NCAA tournament. Logic alone would suggest that BYU will be favored to win a game in the tournament yeah. based on Top seven where they're seed. going to be sure. seeded. So if BYU is a 7, 6, or gulp, even better seed than that, man, go. then you should expect the Cougars to win that game. They will be favored to win a game in the tournament. If you get into that 8-9 scenario, it's a pick em, toss you know. up. Yeah. But BYU now is... Is screaming towards a seven or better seed. Got to be Pepperdine, take care of business in Vegas. But I think that BYU, at the worst, will do one of those two things. Either beat Pepperdine or win the semifinal in Las Vegas. Hopefully they do both and have another shot at Gonzaga in the championship game to help the metrics and keep them on par with that six or maybe five seed. BYU, yes, needs to win a game now because of where they have ascended to. A top 20 team. According to the media, you, you should win one game in the tournament. And one almost feels a little gener- like let's not, be, let's not be scared of, as a top 20 team, winning a game and feeling like if the Cougars lost and were upset in the first round, it wouldn't, it would be, it wouldn't be a disappointing end of the season. That, that would sting. It would be disappointing. Absolutely, that would be disappointing, given the, what's the high that BYU can beat the number two team in the country. What's the low? The low is not that low. What's the low? BYU lost at Utah? San Francisco. I would say to Utah, maybe right. Um, San Francisco, one of the those are quad twos. Those are, those are top one hundred teams, right? One hundred ish. The low is not low, and the way BYU is playing right now is fantastic. So yeah, I I'm very excited. Am I going to say I expect a Sweet Sixteen? No. Will I be shocked? No. I th- a couple weeks ago. Um, we, I was like, no, 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 the Sweet 16, what are we saying? After that game, I'm like, no, 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 I totally believe BYU could win two. Isn't it interesting? I'm not going to expect, though. No, yeah, round of 32 or bust, but isn't yeah. it interesting that that Sweet 16 thing that Jay Billis put out was like, whoa. Now Gary Parrish and Seth Davis are saying Dark Horse Final Four, and it's like, okay, no, it's, let's, uh, let's, it's, let's win one game and then see what happens. It's not even Dark Horse now. It's like, it's, but they feel like, if you're, yeah. if you're like a six, it's pretty reasonable to think you could be in the Sweet 16, right? We'll see. Among the storylines this season is the play of senior T.J. Haas. At one point last year, he probably thought he was going to shoot 30 times a game this season because Childs wasn't <laughs> returning and Jake Toulson wasn't going to come back here. Why would he? Then Mark Pope is hired and things change, right? This year, he's a 14 points a game guy, and he's been the clutch shot taker for most of the year. Obviously, Houston and St. Mary's come to mind. 
So this question comes to mind as well. Is TJ Haas underappreciated? At this very moment, as of 10.09 Mountain Time on February 26, 2020, no. A win over Gonzaga will do that for about everybody on the BYU basketball team. But for much of his BYU career, absolutely, he's been underappreciated. The dude has started every game he's played at BYU. 131 consecutive starts. The Cal Ripken Jr., you would appreciate that one. He is the Iron Man of BYU basketball. He's been consistently really good, but his teams, until this year, weren't great. None of them got to the NCAA tournament. So that has that kind of weighs in on how you look at all of the individual players. Like, oh, yeah, they were good players, but they never made the tournament. Well, that changes now. So people are now looking more fondly on a guy like TJ Haas. Uh, and until now, yes, he's been underappreciated. This season alone, game winner at Houston, game winner against St. Mary's, saved the day in conference play on number on a number of occasions in those games that could potentially have been quad three or quad four losses, BYU against Santa Clara. It, it's TJ time. He takes over. Absolutely. He's he's the ginger mamba, and yes. he's, he's finally no, appreciated. No, it's ginger, G-I-N-G-A. Or is it ER? I like the GA just because Ginger okay. Mamba. Graphics team, note for next time. <laughs> I don't know. Is In your opinion, is he underappreciated? It says underrated. I don't know who's rating him. Underappreciated? Sure. He's a really good player. What like What is he to BYU fans? I think he's appreciated more now than he was because of made shots at Houston against Santa, uh, St. Mary's. He has the kid during the season. That's an amazing story. The Deep Blue Chronicle that. It was awesome. I think that outside, he's known as a meme at Portland. We're not, we can't repeat that one on BYU TV. Uh, <laughs> even though he edited himself in the moment. I think that fans see him and they make a judgmental appearance about his lack of hair and hairline and what. It, the dude can ball. The dude can ball, right? Um, we know he can. He's won some big games. We always lost some small games as well over the years, but we're going to remember the good when, when all is said and done. Seventh in points all time. Wow. Can we just sit on that one for three seconds? Seventh in points all time. He's going to cross 1,900 points on Saturday. That's amazing. Second in assists all time. Third in made threes. Eighth in free throw percentage. First in consecutive games played. Second in games started. He's only six behind uh, Tyler, by the way. Just straight up games started. Whoa. Fourth in minutes played. This dude's been the Iron Man, yes. And guess what? We hoped the Lone Peak 3 was going to make a Final Four. Maybe this team makes a Final Four. Who knows? That's blue goggles, right? <laughs> but, like, TJ Haas has been the one guy that lasted all four years. The Lone Peak and, solo. And I like Eric Mika. I love Eric Mika. And I love uh, Nick Emery, you know? And, and we hoped those guys were going to be together and that they would do this. We're seeing Toulson, Childs, and Haas do what we hoped Eric Mika and Nick Emery and TJ Haas would do. I'm, it's just a different version of the big a, three. It's a different version, yes. But TJ is the last guy. He's the only guy that made it to the end of the race here, right? There were different paths for different dudes. Life changes, right? So to some degree, we're going to cherish the time we had with TJ Haas forever. Does he look different than other people? Yes. Does that matter? No. 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 In fact, it makes him stick out a little bit more in a unique way. I right? think it's all part of, uh, yeah, in a, in a fan, I think it's a fantastic thing. In, in kind he's, of this unique he's way. He's our dude. I like it. He's our guy that looks 40. You know what I mean? We always play the, the coaches play up the advantage. Listen, this, we've been, I, I told this to TJ after the game. I said, what a journey we've been on with you. Because I said, when did you commit? He's like, right after my freshman year. So I said, three is high school, two on a mission, four here. Nine-year journey with this guy. Typically, it's like a four to six year with a player. It's been a nine-year journey with TJ. And it's been, it's, look, look at where it's taken us. The first three years, fun to watch him. BYU didn't do anything. But this last year, forget about the last three years. You know what I mean? I'm glad TJ Haas is on BYU's team because looking at other fan bases, he is the most hated man on BYU basketball. Because they think, how does this guy, yes. based on how he looks, beat us? He's Manu Ginobili. So effective, so good, so efficient. I hated that guy yeah. when he played for the Spurs because he was so consistently good and just did, like, surprising things. Like, whoa, and then, Manu, Manu does that? And then I'll always remember in that game Saturday night that TJ Haas was a baller defensively. You know what I mean? the energy. Took two Set charges, stripping guys, rebound. Like, that was great. That was great. Enjoy it, people. 
enjoy the hype for the team and enjoy I'm, TJ Haas on yeah, this team. This journey has been so fun, and it's Pepperdine, and it's Vegas, and it's the turn. We just have a couple games left. BYU basketball projected as a six seed, according to ESPN's Joe Lenardi, just two spots away from a, wait for it, five seed. How is this possible? A team that hasn't been to the NCAA tournament in five years. Has nothing to do with it. Is now climbing toward a five seed. What's the path, Jerem, to BYU obtaining a five seed in the bracket? Obtaining? Is this the scriptures? Uh, Burning. Uh, BYU obviously needs to beat Pepperdine and avoid a quad uh, two at the moment loss. It'll probably be a quad three on Selection Sunday. Then uh, you got to win the semifinal, likely against St. Mary's. And then to get a five, I think that BYU is probably going to need to beat Gonzaga. Really? Because I think BYU is going to drop a seed anyway with Sunday play. I'm just, we're going to bring Tom Holmel in. I'm just convinced that BYU probably is going to drop a seed line. Um, because of Sunday play and how the bracket shakes out. So to get a five, BYU would need to actually be a four. That's what I believe. The last time BYU was really good in 2011, we kind of had the same thought. Oh, Brandon Davies isn't playing. No Sunday play for BYU. What is the committee going to think of Jimmer and this team now? I don't know. They'll probably be a four or a five seed. They got a three seed. They got a, they got a three seed. So just maybe the committee shocks us and doesn't penalize BYU for no Sunday play, trying to fit him in because it's super annoying. Yeah. At the time, BYU was like 30 and 3. A 3 was fair. A 4 or 5 would be weird. I know, I know. But yeah. this, the committee is now judging BYU based on who they are with Yoli Childs, which is 15 and 2, and they beat St. Mary's and Gonzaga. Right. I mean, in 2011, BYU was 30 and 4 going into Selection Sunday. That's, that's a 3 seed. I don't think that BYU needs to beat Gonzaga again to earn a five seed. If BYU beats Gonzaga again in Las Vegas, now we're talking about the real likelihood that they have beaten on back-to-back nights St. Mary's and Gonzaga well, if they on beat a Gonzaga, neutral court. Yes, they would have done that. Yeah. Then we're talking about probably like a four seed. If BYU beats Gonzaga twice no. in a three-week span, now they're, now they're looking at, no, no kidding, a I four just seed. told you that's my thought. I, yeah. think, they'll, I think they'll drop a spot. Yeah, that's, that's what I think. Okay. Well, the, I, I hope for a four. Four would be incredible. That's the ceiling, by the way. Yes. A four I don't would think be, BYU I think it's five. has to be Gonzaga, though, to, to be a five seed. They could beat Pepperdine and St. Mary's and I think be a five seed, even with Sunday play and even if will, they lose to Gonzaga. Will BYU be punished uh, for losing to Gonzaga again? Why? But, why would they? No, that's uh, it's a question. It's not an answer. Um, will BYU be punished? That's the question. Because if if BYU plays like a tw- if BYU loses by twelve or something, and trust me, that'd be an actually decent margin given how tough it is to play Gonzaga in Vegas. It's a road game. It's definitely it's tougher than Spokane. BYU's won up there three times. They've never won in Vegas, right against Gonzaga. But an opportunity, and uh, Gonzaga is going to be ready for BYU this time around. I'm just hoping BYU gets through St. Mary's. Let's not forget, without Yoli Childs, BYU loses by three in overtime at uh, St. Mary's. And then at home, it took this amazing shot by T.J. Haas. That's going to be a really tough game. Just because BYU beat Gonzaga on Saturday doesn't mean BYU is just going to blow through St. Mary's. That is a tough game for BYU. The motivation going into Saturday was incredible. Will the Cougars be equally motivated and not rusty? They will have not played a game for 12 days or something, right, or nine days since Pe- from Pepperdine, St. Mary's, like nine days, right? That's going to be a big game, assuming it's St. Mary's. What if San Francisco pulls off the upset and takes down St. Mary's? That'd be a bad thing. We want St. Mary's. We want another quad one on the far left column of the resume. It would be a quad two if it were a team like San Francisco on a neutral court. Right. That's what but that's not going to help you as one. much, yeah. obviously, as a quad one opportunity. And, which, by the way, who's the last team to beat BYU? San Francisco. Mm. They won by one at home. They wouldn't take down BYU in that situation, I don't think, right? But they are the last team to beat BYU. BYU's won the only child. eight games in a row. Can make it nine against Pepperdine. And a 10-game win streak if they win the West Coast Conference semifinal against St. Mary's? That's why I'm thinking a five seed is realistic even if BYU doesn't beat Gonzaga. I'll take a five right now. And I would love that because if you win, you match up with a four or a 13. And, oh, I'm afraid of the 5-12. I would take the five in an instance. Don't question me on that one. (laughs) This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio.
hear what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Joining us now in Studio B as part of this Wednesday show is a 1,000-point scorer, according to BYU Women's Basketball and their annals, Paisley Johnson. Welcome to Studio B. Congratulations on 1,000 points. Thank you. Thank you. That was an epic moment for sure. So let's relive it, shall we? Because I love that. apparently when you do something good at BYU, you just get doused in water. Whether you're a coach <laughs> yeah. or a player, it's just, just water crazy, time, right? right? Yeah, that was crazy. I was completely – I had just taken a shower. And it was all, all really? everywhere. Really? It was post-shower? Isn't this normally <laughs> okay, pre-shower? Okay, no. I, I had taken a shower because all the girls made me take a shower with all the water. I didn't actually take a shower. I was just doused as oh, if uh, I had. Yes. Oh, yes. I guess. Yes. There you go. Yeah. I no. thought you would like already pre- I was like, you were in your dream. You had it <laughs> yeah. No, that was awesome. And you couldn't even see. Like, no. They, they got you good. I had girls from all different angles with all different water bottles. I had girls grabbing the ice from the cooler and chucking at me. I was oh. just like. Oh, ice is mean. Yeah. I was ice just like, cool. okay, I'm, I'm getting hit. But it was so fun. I didn't expect <laughs> it. I didn't even know I was going to hit 1,000 points that game. So it was, it was a surprise. And it was awesome that my teammates were just so. Like there with me with it. I asked, yeah, I asked it in the moment. Is it? This is a celebratory thing, right? Of course, this is, yeah. This is a like good thing, right? Ah! With ice? Yeah. No, yeah, it was so nice. I have an issue sweet. with throwing ice in this moment. <laughs> I think the water is fine, right? Ice is different. Um, let's talk about where this team's at. So, two games left in the regular season, as, as I mentioned, at home, both on BYU TV. Shameless plug. You guys have a chance at that two seed. Um, what What would it mean if you guys got that two seed to the? Semifinals, triple by is a big deal. Um, yeah, going into the season, we either wanted the two seed, most definitely, obviously the first seed, but the second seed and the third seed, if that's what we wanted at the least. And so going into this last week of games, if we get that, we don't have to play as many games at the tournament, back to back to back. And so that's less, um, that's more legs for us in that championship game. And we just have a better shot there. Like, if we get second, if we get third, if we get third, we have to play another game on, I think it's either Saturday or Friday, on Saturday, which that's not a problem. We'll have Sunday to rest. But um, if we get that, if we get that second seed, it's a lot easier route to the NCAA tournament. The legs aren't an issue for you. Come on. <laughs> For the last five games. Paisley's played 39 or 40 minutes. Yeah, what's up with you and Brenna? Do you ever come out of the game? game? (laughs) I guess not. Um, He just thinks we're Sonic, the Sonic Squirrel or something. But, um, yeah, surprisingly, I've I've gotten into shape this year, closer now to the end of the season. Not that I didn't the past years, but um, it's been good, and I've been able to keep up, and I just need to get more legs in at the end of the game so my shot's not as short, but... Paisley Johnson with us on BYU Sports Nation, the Sonic Squirrel or Hedgehog or whatever you want to be. <laughs> uh, when you consider where you are tied with San Diego, how much scoreboard watching takes place through the remaining regular season games? Yeah, it's awful because we usually play first just because that's how things have like played out. Plus in, in Utah. The well, mountain time zone. The mountain time's different, right? Um, but... Yeah, it's definitely going back and forth like, oh, are we praying to let them lose or something like that? But no, yeah, it's it's bouncing back and forth. What's the tiebreaker with San Diego, by the way? Remind me. Um, it's the Portland game. So right the, now it's the Portland game. Yeah, because you split the regular season, or did yeah. you just split? Okay. And San Diego swept Portland. So San Diego needs to lose, uh, and, and you we need, need to, win. to continue to win. So, so win two games, and then hope that San Diego Drops loses one. this. Okay, yes. gotcha. Big games this week, obviously with Pepperdine and Elmu. You beat both those teams by eighteen and fifteen, respectively. So how do you make sure you win at home and do your part here? Right. So we got to just come out. Um, our defense has been what's been key the the whole year because. We really haven't been putting up the numbers that we usually do on offensive, on the offensive board. So, um, if we continue to do that and just shutting down teams and keeping them in their low numbers, we'll like have an incredible chance at scoring. And if we just come out with intensity and make sure every single play, with not scoring as much this season, we have to come with every single play and just be ready to like get on the floor if it's a loose ball or get that extra box out just to get the extra possession. Now, what people may not know is that energy and intensity that you bring to the actual game 
starts well before the game. <laughs> it's all about the pregame swag, right? You got to come in with the right attitude, the right mentality. And you have taken that to another level <laughs> with uh, an array of colors. So the Daily Universe puts out this picture of you walking into the Marriott Center, <laughs> into your locker room in, the, in this getup. So walk us through how that happened and this the story. This is fantastic. Oh, describe Look at that you, jacket. Describe what you're wearing here. Okay, so this is the vintage Nike tracksuit with a teal and purple <laughs> color frame. Um, shout out Stephanie Johnson, my mom. This was hers, and I stole it from her. <laughs> wow. And I brought it to college three years ago and just decided, okay, this will come into use. I have Right? I have my purple aviators from somewhere in the (laughs) university mall. And then I have my Chanel bag that Connor got me from Italy. Oh, Connor. Stepping up his game. The fall. (laughs) Nice. Now, now it was fun because the universe did some of the women's team. They did some of the men's team. Now, Evan Troy had an incredible get up. Like a suit. Yes. Do you feel like yours is stronger than that? How do you feel? Um, I might have to give this one to him just because (laughs) that was outrageous and amazing. um, And that's not even the one I'm referring to. No, that's not the one. Um, With this one, sorry, I win that. I win that competition. Yep, you win that. But with his um, sweatsuit, or with his uh, suit suit, suit jacket. Yeah, yeah. I like suit suit better. With his suit 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 suit. Um, Yeah, he took the he took the cake with that one. By the way, I, I'm still reveling in the uh, awesome boyfriend moment from Connor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pretty good. No. There's plenty of those. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, is there a signature oh. on that sweatshirt? <laughs> yeah, by yeah the let's way? talk about that. I noticed that, too. You tried to cover it with your hair. Nice try. So it's definitely number a little 44? bit faded. Who's number 44 on the men's basketball oh team? <laughs> yeah, that's Connor Harding. Shout out number 44. <laughs> he signed my yeah, um, particular sweatshirt interest in him. after he won. Um, a game, so which which game? <laughs> okay, I can't really remember. It's the last one I went to because obviously I haven't been able to go as, a little to busy. as many as him because um, I've been on the court as well. But yeah, after one of them, I can't really remember. But he played really well, and this, I was like, "You have to sign it." Is this while you were dating? Oh, before? of course. Okay. Yeah, it was like yeah. it was probably oh, yeah. like a month ago. Like <laughs> a month ago. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. Um, w- while we're talking about Connor, uh, we want to turn you into an analyst right here. Okay. So. He makes this nice pass to Yoli Childs. Um, mm-hmm. We want you to break this play down against Gonzaga. Perfect. So, that's the end of the game. So walk us through that pass to Yoli for the dunk. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, so he drives right, and um, I find out later that this play, it was actually supposed to be for TJ, but Connor decides to take it into his own accord and drive right. Um, obviously he took that advantage, took two defenders with him and just dumped it right off to Yoli with an exclamation point with Yoli completely like kipping on this dunk <laughs> and destroying Gonzaga at this point. So I think Gonzaga after this one definitely knew that the game was over and it was time to go home. So that was good. That, that was, was really, really, good. Really, good. really good. That was really good. Yes. That was really good. The only thing that Connor didn't do well there is he, he didn't he didn't know that he you know how when you make a great play you're the first one up the court? Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes the other defenders looking up at the he he just slammed I into think, the Gonzaga. Yeah, I think <clears> he was definitely still watching and was pretty amazed at how like ecstatic Yoli was with that dunk, but sure. he was shocked. He was reveling in that amazing pass. Yeah. I just made an I amazing did, pass. Wow. Boom! I always get annoyed at the guys that are in my way, but it's like, no, I ran into him. You know <laughs> yeah, I mean? yeah. Coming back. That's my bad. Sorry. Paisley Johnson with us on BYU Sports Nation. Uh, what is that like for you to watch um, an epic win like that in, this, in an interesting situation? Because you're coming off a loss, but you got to come home and move, and move it forward. So what were the emotions like for you on Saturday? Oh, it was crazy because we were in the airport and my whole team, we're doing our thing, we're doing homework, but then once the game's on, like, I have my laptop out with the game on, Lee has li- his laptop out, Mally has hers, I have my phone set up, so if anybody knew that to go walk away and have it, like, we are completely engrossed in that game and ready to support the boys, and um, we knew this game was huge for them, and it's just, um, it's just super exciting to have a program kind of go through what we went through last year. Um, and it's just like I, I can share those emotions I had last year with Connor and just like relate with him and just kind of like live through him in that moment. And then our time will come later on in the season. And it's just different timing. But 
yeah, my whole team was so excited. And then we're on the plane and you know how they usually tell you to put the laptop away? Well, I still had mine out in the seat next to me and like <laughs> the lady was going to talk to me. I was putting Shaylee's blanket over mine so she didn't see her or something like that. So yeah, we we were definitely very excited. And although we were coming off that loss, um, I think it's it's also good to like watch the boys and see what we can learn from their team because um, I, I, every single time I go on Instagram, there's always highlights of different teams in the NCAA, and it's just fun to see different girls and their ways of attacking or different boys with their ways of attacking teams, and it, it gives you inspiration. So um, I think definitely watching that game and seeing the heart and the focus and just all the intensity withdrawal in the BYU men's team and they, very exciting. And they learned from you, right? You guys yep. were a turning team last year, they weren't, <laughs> and, and uh, you're hoping to both be turning teams, right? Um, we actually hung out at the same restaurant, a local establishment. We just didn't, <laughs> we just we didn't, didn't know about see it. each other or talk until you guys were walking out. We're like, oh, there's Paisley and oh, Connor. Oh, hey, Paisley yeah. and Connor. And it's, <laughs> one, a, it's 1 a.m. We're, uh, we're hanging out. That's great. Well, uh, good luck against uh, Pepperdine and LMU. Let's give you the BYU Sports Nation karma. Two Take big it. games. Run with it. Please. Both, both on BYU TV. And uh, thanks for coming in. Great Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. It's time now for your BYU Basketball NCAA Tournament Resume Update. Presented by Bodyguards. Protection for a life worth living. Learn more at bodyguards.com. Hit the music in the net rankings. BYU, as they have been for the past few days, holding steady at number 14. Very, very good mark. 15 in Ken Palm. No change there. BPI at 18. Sagarin, they drop one from 18 to 19, and they also drop one in strength of record and KPI. They're down two spots, but I mean, no major movement, primarily because they haven't played a game. We'll see what happens tomorrow after BYU and Pepperdine go final. Bracket Matrix, all 94 brackets, of course. Average seed 6.13, high of 8, low of 4. The Rootables, no games of consequence today, but we'll cover the uh, the weekend. Let's look at Joe Lenardi's seed lines in teams around BYU. Of okay, so we're, we're, we're branching outside of the West Coast Conference here. Yes, West Virginia, Iowa, Colorado, Michigan, Michigan State are five teams seated just ahead of BYU. Uh, West Virginia has six seed, Iowa, Colorado, Michigan, Michigan State has five seeds. So the uh, there's some teams around BYU you're hoping hoping you lose, but tomorrow Oklahoma at number twenty, West Virginia. You hope for an upset there to help okay. BYU's cause. Penn State and Iowa matchup of number sixteen and eighteen. Uh, interesting to see that Arizona at UCLA. This one could really help BYU. UCLA currently uh, in the net seventy six. If BYU can get that into somehow the top fifty, that would be another quad one. That's a stretch a little bit. I don't think uh, UCLA will drop past 100 unless they just go on a little losing streak. But the Bruins are hot right now, and that would be nice. Uh, so BYU's resume is just fine right now. They could slide in as a six. Uh, but if they play St. Mary's and win, play Gonzaga either way, win, amazing. BYU's going to go up to five, four or five. If they lose, I don't see BYU dropping past a seven. Um, if they lose in the WCC tournament, either to St. Mary's or Gonzaga. Pepperdine's the key here. Just avoid any blemish. Quad three or quad Beat Pepperdine four. and BYU will be a seven or better, at worst. Yes, at worst. At and, worst. And a seven for this squad would be somewhat of a disappointment given the way they're playing right now, right? <laughs> if BYU gets a five, oh, that's a tremendous seed. Four or five. Six, fine as well, but you're playing a top 12 team as a three seed, barring an upset, and a 3-14. So BYU in a really good spot. Just beat Pepperdine. If you can beat St. Mary's, should it be St. Mary's? No guarantee, by the way. They've got to win their quarterfinal. Then you go into uh, the NCAA Tournament Selection Sunday, and you're feeling pretty good about life. Okay, I'll give you my top five teams to root for over the weekend. Jerem just laid out uh, most of the big matches on Saturday and Sunday. Yes, Oklahoma at West Virginia is a big one. Boomer Sooner, let's go. Uh, in that Iowa-Penn State matchup, I would propose that Iowa beat Penn State because uh, the Nittany Lions have consistently been above BYU, and just maybe that'll shake some things up. Yes, UCLA over Arizona, the Bruins are rolling. And then on Sunday, the Stanford-Colorado matchup is interesting. Stanford's good at home. Colorado is reeling a bit, but they're still above BYU in the seed line, so root hard for Stanford to beat Colorado. Uh, Can't forget St. Mary's at Gonzaga and Utah State in New Mexico. Jeremy, who do you want to win the St. Mary's-Gonzaga game? St. Mary's, because we need uh, that that home win to be a quad one. 
Gonzaga is going to be a two seed. That's going to be a top ten win. It's St. Mary's that could become another quad one win for BYU. Could could St. Mary's numbers get better by playing Gonzaga on the road? Certainly, but if even you losing. Win, but if you win, that's better. <laughs> Dope or nope with Ben Bagley. Ben, a game like this must feature you, my friend. That's because it's dope. That's right. Dope or nope. We'll start with number one. Playing a play-in team in the first round of the NCAA tournament. I could go both ways on this one. I, I, both. Uh, a team has a little momentum, has already kind of gotten the jitters out of playing in the NCAA tournament game, yet may have tired legs a little bit playing two days and traveling the next day, right? It'd be a Tuesday, travel Wednesday, play Thursday, be always sitting there. Uh, I'd go either direction on that one. I say dope primarily because it's tough to turn around after winning a game and then have to play one of the best offensive teams in the country like BYU uh, and try and hold them down on limited preparation. And that's the case for everybody in the second round as well. Like if BYU wins, it's like, oh, we're playing someone two days later. Yeah, I, I would I would love for BYU to be in a position where they take on a play-in winner just because that means BYU is playing really good basketball and are viewed as a team that deserves to take on a play-in winner. I don't want it to be USC or Oklahoma, though. I'd rather it be a mid-major. Okay. Next. Dopest or nopest? Possible first-round tournament locations for BYU, which would be Albany, St. Louis, Spokane, or Tampa. Spokane would be the best uh, regionally, I think, for BYU fans to get to. Albany would be a long ways away, yet there's kind of a Jimmer Fredette connection with Glens Falls not being too far from that location. That's where you fly into if you're trying to get to Jimmer uh, Jimmer's uh, old stomping ground. So, I, I, dopest is uh, Spokane. I think nopest is probably Albany, but uh, Tampa or St. Louis would be cool too. Okay, yeah, I'd rank them Spokane number one, the Northwest, huge contingent of BYU fans. They would show up and show out, be heard. St. Louis, probably number two for me in the Midwest. I know there's a nice faction of BYU fans. We saw this in Knoxville, Tennessee. People would show up in St. Louis as well. Missouri again. Yeah, Andy Reid might be there. Who knows? Let's go. Uh, and then prob- I'd Other probably side. take Albany over Tampa. I think there would be more BYU fans in the Northeast in upstate New York than there would be in Florida. you got to think about your enjoyment here. Come on. Well, uh, you want me to go to the beach? Is that what you're saying? Man, where are we going? Albany! <laughs> Love Albany. Okay. I've, I've been to Albany, I'm, but I'm versus think, Tampa? I'm thinking about on. BYU and the reception they'll have in each of these locations. Yes, the, the beach would always be nice. Next. Dope or nope? Possibility of having nine days in between games for BYU from Saturday to the West Coast Conference semifinal. It's dope for potential uh, injuries, right? Can Dalton Nixon Amen. somehow get back? Amen. That, it's nope for momentum right um and it's good to prepare there's going to be some tired legs from other teams playing a day or two later where yeah you're right the point you brought up earlier just sitting there waiting for the semis but how much rust comes in when i i I do think it's dope mainly for dalton nixon's uh foot right rest up the bumps and bruises it allows gavin baxter a little bit more time to practice with the team to get more acclimated yoli child's finger heals a little bit more Jake Toulson's ankle has some more rest. Dalton Nixon's foot can heal. Like, I am all about the rest for BYU before tournament play. Even if they lose the game in the West Coast Conference semis, what th- they can get the rust out there and be ready to go by the time the real tournament hits. You could go into nine days with a nine-game win streak, and it's like, oh, let's just play again. Let's go, let's go. But Yeah, you're, no, there is something I'll about I'll take Mike. the seed more than the days. But I, I like the rest for BYU. I think this is the best possible scenario. Next. By the way, if all goes to plan, there's a possibility of four games in 25 days from Gonzaga last Saturday. What is this, to, football? Yes. Yes, <laughs> to the to game one of the NCAA tournament. Last one, dope or nope, being born on a leap day. I would go nope. You know, it's just like, oh, man, I don't my, I don't even have a birthday this year. You're celebrating it on a day that isn't even your birthday? I'd go nope on that one. I mean, it's unique because you can lie about your age. I mean, you're 64 and you're like, I'm turning 16 today. Sweet 16. What are you, a vampire? <laughs> <laughs> so the, it is kind of unique and fun, and it's a good conversation starter. But, yeah, it'd be weird. Like, 
I don't have a birthday this year. Like February 29th is not going to happen. According to the calculations of how we rotate around <laughs> the sun in every four years, I don't have a birthday, but I know I was born because I exist. Uh, I will celebrate my birthday uh, between 11.59 p.m. on February 28th and uh, 12.01 a.m. on March Geneva, 1st. Geneva uh, Standard Time. <laughs> Join the conversation 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Yes, BYU head to the land headed to the land of enchantment, not the land of the enchanted, as uh, was once uh, said by a president of the United States. Uh, <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> and they're looking for their first win against New Mexico. Dropped the first two games to the Lobos in close fashion. Yeah, 5-4, 2-0. Joining, joining us now to talk about how to beat New Mexico is BYU baseball pitcher Jared Lesser. Jared, welcome to Studio B. Jared. How are you guys? Thanks we're for awesome, me. man. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're doing great. As are you and your team, 5-3. and three. Uh, I did mention uh, the two losses to New Mexico. We'll get to that in a moment. But uh, a group of cardiac cougs. What's the superstition secret that's paying off in late innings for BYU baseball? I have no idea. It would be a lot easier if we could just get it done in the first couple innings. You know, it's a little nerve-wracking to finally start scoring some runs in about the seventh, eighth inning and, and almost like a come-from-behind victory every single time. It's been I like know. sack flies in the eighth, and then you guys win a 14-inning game that like goes into the Gonzaga game Saturday. So you yeah. guys, I think you guys should have uh, hurried up a little more. You could have watched the game earlier, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was it was tough to miss that, and... And all the excitement that was going on with the basketball team. And, you know, we just got to watch highlights and, and check it out after the game. So so what is it about this team that makes you guys so good, able to rally and come back and win late? I would just say, like, team victories really right now. I mean, if you look at our lineup cards at the end of games, I mean, we have, like, seven, eight guys coming in to sub and pitch hit. I mean, you got guys, defensive substitutions for an inning, um, pitchers coming in throwing the one batter, pitchers coming in and throwing four innings. You know, it's really it's really just been a team win and everybody just kind of coming together for the team and, and getting it done. Yeah, the 14-inning uh, marathon against Cal Poly on Saturday night is memorable. What is a game like that for a pitching staff? How, how do you balance that and manage that? I mean, the biggest thing for, like, a pitching staff is just, like, you know, who's next? You know, it's like anybody who's struggling a little bit, you know, guys get on, especially a close game and extra innings. It's like, okay, we got to hurry up and rotate the next guy out. I mean, we had – Position players getting ready to come in and throw. Mitch McIntyre, starting center fielder, he comes in and throws an inning. Um, then you got guys who threw the game before, the nine-inning game that we lost, 10 to nothing. Guys are warming up, going to the game again. Cooper McKeon um, pitching back-to-back. Tyson Heaton pitching back-to-back games. So it's just really all hands on deck. Who's ready to go? You know, who can throw an inning? A couple I've, of pitches. I've been impressed by the freshmen. Who, For sure. Who have come in and, and been lights out, especially against Oregon State. It was like the last three or four pitchers yep. were all freshmen, and they got the win. Yeah, I mean, cold-blooded, man. I mean, you got to have nerves of steel to go in, especially a team against Oregon State. You know, easily could be a little intimidated making, you know, a couple guys making their debuts against Oregon State. And just to go in there and just just trust their stuff, man, and just and just get it done for us. Every win feels good, but which of the five wins that you have uh, piled up this year has been the best overall for the team, do you think? Overall, for me, I would say probably the Gonzaga game. You know, starting off the season, big win against a conference opponent. You know, set the tone for hoops. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gonzaga's Um, picked to win the conference, no less. Yeah, which I mean, yeah, we kind of proved that wrong, but (laughs) not a ball to be played. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. But I mean, even just like I mean, we came back from them. You know, they they threw a really good left-handed pitcher with a good changeup. I mean, and then as soon as we got him off, you know, we just grinded some at bats, got him off the mound, and and then just took over from there. So. Let's talk about you. Uh, 6'4", 220, senior from Price, Utah State Eastern. Yes, sir. So played in your hometown, and now you're at BYU. What led you to come to Provo? Um, honestly, the coaching staff. Um, you know, like when I came on visits and stuff, they really just made me feel accepted. Um, and, then, and then being close to home, you know, being able for my family to come up and see me play often um, and go back home and visit a little bit. So. Uh, do you- can you play wide receiver on the football team? You're 6'4", 220. Jaron Hall could throw you some passes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, not anymore. My football days are over. <laughs> Jared Lesser, BYU baseball player, yes, is sir. with us on BYU Sports oh, Nation, yeah. an outstanding pitcher. <laughs> what makes this team unique compared to all of the other teams that you've been a part of, whether it be BYU or not? What makes this year's team unique? I would say the biggest thing that makes us unique right now 
is uh, a lot of young guys. I mean, we have, I mean, we have three seniors, and I mean, all of us don't even feel like veterans because all of us are junior college transfers. So, I mean, this is my second year. For a lot of guys, it's their second year. It's their first year, um, and even like a majority of our juniors, you know, just coming off a two-year mission. So then, you know, they've only been back on the team for another two years too. So it really feels like everybody's just really young, which I think is is really unique for us, and and gives us that opportunity of like. A lot of growth. A lot of guys get some playing time and really kind of like find their spot. What are your uh, What are your pitches and what's your best pitch? Whew. So I throw. I kind of throw like a cut fastball, and then I have a slider, curveball, and then kind of a changeup. So I would say my best pitch is cut fastball and a slider for sure. Who influenced you as a pitcher growing up? Whew. Who influenced me as a Whether pitcher? Whether it was pros or coaches or anything like that. Um, honestly, a pitcher that. I really looked up to as a pitcher from my hometown. His name's Brady Martinez. Um, he was in the Yankees organization, worked with me as a young kid, and, and just really like looked at him as like a kid from Price who actually you know made it. So, you know, I really looked up to him a little bit, and and he really helped me a lot with pitching growing up. I love going inside the mind of a pitcher because, as you mentioned, you have to have nerves of steel in some high pressure situations. So let's put you in a hypothetical scenario: bases <laughs> loaded, full count, two down, late inning, games tied. What's happening in your mind? I don't even – just get the guy out, really. I mean, just throw your best pitch, trust your stuff, um, trust the guys behind you. I mean, that's the biggest thing um, as a pitcher, just being able to trust the defense behind you. Um, even if you do miss a spot, you know, guys are going to make guys are gonna make a play for you. So really just, just throw a strike. <laughs> you have three appearances. But you always won all three games. Should you play more? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, like, uh, I mean – you know, I trust the coaches, the game plan, and everything that they've got. Um, you know, I did the little closing thing against Gonzaga, started against Oregon State, and then the fourth game against Cal Poly. So, you know, really it's just whenever I'm called upon, whenever whenever they need me in whatever situation, you know, I, I just want to be ready to go and help my team win. How do you approach that mentally? Because I, th- I think right now you're, what, the, the the early week starter? Yeah. Is that where you're at? Like a, yeah, like the midweek, midweek starter. Midweek starter, and then yeah, like, yeah. A, like a reliever of sorts. You closed one game, right? Mm-hmm. Mentally, how do you approach, okay, this game I may be this, but another game I may be that? I mean, it's all in like the preparation. So like if I was getting ready for a start, you know, it's like the day before, I might not throw that much. Day before that, you know, get a bullpen in. Um, but when you're going into like a closing situation, like a weekend series, if I was like a closer, late reliever, reliever, whatever, um, really it's just like keeping your arm fresh all the time, really getting a lot of long toss in. And just, you know, really being engaged in the game and ready to go at any time. Jared Lesser is more. I'm sorry. Just, <laughs> you waited till the I, end. I, you know, I, I can respect that. that I, that's I, not the first time. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Four games with New Mexico coming up. We mentioned you lost the first two of them in hard-fought battles. What's the scouting report on how to get it done against the Lobos? I would say really just, just get on their pitching early. Um, you know, we kind of – and that's kind of been like a little bit of a struggle so far right now is just a little bit of hitting. But, I mean – you know, pitchers just keep doing what we're doing, honestly. Um, just keeping up, pounding the zone, you know, working early ahead of counts. And, I mean, just really letting guys work for us behind us and, and just kind of get on their pitching early, for sure. Let's give you some BYU Sports Nation karma. It's good luck uh, in the uh, upcoming games. And do you mind signing our flag? No, yeah, for sure. Okay, awesome. All right, Thanks, Jared, Jared Lesser in Studio from B. From Price, man. You know who else is from Price? President Worthen. President and Sister Worthen. Yep. And they know I love them. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Let's keep it rolling, BYU Sports Nation, and whip it. It's time for the Cougar Whip Around. Men's basketball. BYU plays Pepperdine tomorrow to finish the regular season with a win. The Cougars will be the two seed or with a St. Mary's loss at Gonzaga. The Zags have locked down the one seed. BYU 14 in net ranking, six seed in Joe Lenardi's latest bracket this morning against 11 seed play-in game USC and Oklahoma. Ooh, football. Play-in game. All right, BYU football has new schedule announcements. Boise State on November 6th as that game has been moved to a Friday night in Idaho. Also, BYU and Fresno State of the Mountain West Conference announce a two-game series. The first game in Fresno, November 8th, 2025, back in Provo at Lavelle Edwards Stadium on October 9th of 2027. The Bulldogs lead that overall series in 11 games, 6-5. to five. In the XFL, Colby Pearson and the New York Guardians face off against the L.A. Wildcats Saturday. Micah Hamlin and the Tampa Bay Vipers take on DeAndre Wesley and the D.C. Defenders Sunday. T. John Karoma and his biceps. 
As well as the rest of the Houston Roughnecks play Tomasi Laulile and the Dallas Renegades Sunday at 4 Eastern. Women's basketball. Are they the Renegades of Funk? Is that what they are? Sure, why not? Yeah, the Rage. Cougars beat Pepperdine in a nail-biter, 66-64, led by Brennan Drollinger's 17 points and 6 assists, banking in threes. Cougars senior day is tomorrow against LMU, 4 Eastern on BYU TV. Volleyball. Undefeated BYU ranked number two in all the land. The men are rolling. They host number 13 Stanford tomorrow at the Smith Fieldhouse, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, live on BYU TV with Jerem Jordan and Steve Vale on the call. This marks the Cougars' last home game until April 2nd. Softball. Cougars beat Cal Poly 9-1, then took down Illinois 7-6. BYU plays number 25 Texas Tech in Boise State today, then Cal tomorrow. All in Fullerton at the Judy Garman Not Garland Classic. Baseball. BYU baseball drops the first game of their series with New Mexico, 8-7. The Cougars have lost all three games against the Lobos this season. And all by two runs or less. Wild. And have three more to play in Albuquerque this weekend. BYU did score six runs in the seventh inning to tie the game, but fall short on a walk-off by New Mexico. Next game today, 2 Eastern. And then you can listen live on BYU Radio tomorrow at 2 Eastern. Track and field. The MPSF Championships in Seattle, but the men and women are there. The ladies are ranked ninth. They'll compete against 21 teams, including number four USC, number seven Oregon, number eight Stanford, number 10 Washington. The host. Gymnastics. 19th ranked BYU, the Gym Cats. They head to number 52 Illinois State for a meet. First time these programs will match up in the guard young head coach era at BYU. The Cougars have won five straight dual meets and could really use about a 196.5 score or better to help bolster that regional qualifying score. You want to be a top 16 team so that you're nationally seated. Golf. Zach Blair is tied for 112th at 6 over par at the Honda Classic. Best of luck to Zach, who is even uh, through round two, and he's uh, through two holes today. Cougars in Pro Hoops. Three Elijah Bryant had 13 points, two assists, and three rebounds in a Maccabi Tel Aviv 71-70 win over Olympiacos. And for Barcelona, Brandon Davies had 16 points against CSKA Moscow in EuroLeague play, qualifying for the playoffs with a win there. Tennis. The BYU men on the road to face off against number 43, Denver. I love that we're doing rankings all the way to 52 in gymnastics and 43 in tennis. BYU tomorrow, 2.30 Eastern. The Cougars are on a two-match win streak. Denver, however, 9-1 and one this season, while the Cougars are 5-6. and six. Women's team plays number 45, Utah, tonight in Salt Lake. BYU 6-2 and two on the season on a three-match win streak. Time for and one. Jerem Jordan leading the way, 43-38. Let's make our picks. Picks, predictions, and one on BYU Sports Nation. You're leading, so why don't you go first? Uh, typically, the the the, def- lose, the loser, the loser, the deficitor. <laughs> you go. No, please. All right. Okay. First pick. I'm going with an exact pick I had in the Gonzaga game, and I feel like this is even more aggressive. Okay. BYU will produce the game's leading score. There's only one point difference between Childs and Ross and Lee. But Ross is playing at home. And he you better believe he's going to come out with a vengeance after getting himself into a little bit of foul trouble against BYU. With a vengeance. Yeah, so uh, I feel like this is aggressive. BYU will produce the game's leading score at Pepperdine against the guy that averages more per game than even Yoli Childs. And what? BYU will win the game by nine points or fewer. Oh, you dog. I think, this, I think this card. will be a close game. Yep, BYU wins, but I think it's going to be a close game. My first pick, Colby Ross scored 21 plus. Averages 20.6 in league play. He only had 16 in Provo. That was because of foul trouble. I think he goes above his average in, uh, on senior night, although he's not a senior. He's a junior. Uh, yeah. And my end one pick. 17 plus. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No. It's not what you think. No, no, no. It's not what you think. BYU will be ranked 17th or better come Monday. Okay. That means they'll win. That means some teams in front of them will lose. BYU will be they will climb, be equal to or climb. Okay. okay. They won't drop. Because <laughs> BYU could drop to 18 okay or something, this. right? If BYU plays the game you're saying and some other teams kind of behind them win or whatever, they could leapfrog them. So 17 plus in the rankings. Just win. Just did win. Did I get you? Were you like, no! Oh, yeah, 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 you did. The first game is the don't, don't do it. <laughs> if you yell like that when I make those picks, you have problems. That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear. 
and catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU TV and BYU Radio.